Eventually, it was dark, and Lefty was starving. Whatever it was that had actually motivated him to leave, the ache in his belly was causing him to reconsider that decision. By this point, he had been walking all day across the barren dunes with nary a bite to eat, and while the oppressive heat of the desert sun had faded as the snow-covered peaks of the Grungle Mountains grew closer, the terrain was still naught but sand and rocks, lacking in anything that a sane person could consider edible. Yet, as he strode slowly through the desert, dragging his shovel behind him, he had hope. When it first began to grow dark, Lefty had spotted a small red light flickering off in the distance, and decided to head towards it. In Lefty's rather limited experience, lights were usually made by people. People were a sure sign of civilization, and civilization almost certainly involved food of some kind. Lefty was, of course, correct in his rather obvious assumptions. As he grew closer, the red twinkle became a small bonfire, which had been built up against the flat face of a large cliff that soon came to loom over him. Around that fire, three hefty figures were cast in silhouette. Fortunately for Lefty, all three of these figures were, in fact, amateur chefs, perfectly capable of serving a warm meal to the starving young man. Unfortunately for Lefty, the trio were also grumpsters of the highest caliber, who would sooner spit in his general direction than offer him any assistance. Sadly, he wouldn't learn either of these facts until it was far too late. The sounds that emanated from the group were Lefty's first indication that approaching them might not be the best plan. Deep, choking belly laughter echoed across the plains in short, sustained bursts. It was the kind of sound that made Lefty uneasy, not because he disliked the sounds of merriment, but because it was the type of laughter he normally associated with the profoundly drunk, which he usually tried to avoid unless he, too, was profoundly drunk. As he drew closer, he could make out that the three of them were gathered not around the fire itself, but around a tiny box which lay on the ground, several hands away from the fire. Made from some kind of dark brown wood, and roughly the size of Lefty's head, the box itself was nothing special. What was special was that, from out of the box, came a muffled voice, sounding much smaller and much less jovial than the three surrounding it. Like you, Lefty was both confused and intrigued by this. He was too tired to quicken his stride, though, and so continued walking at the same leisurely pace, observing the scene with ever-growing clarity as he grew closer. Whatever was in the box, it clearly wasn't happy, letting out groans of pain and frustration, which the men, who were indeed quite intoxicated, seemed to find hilarious. The three of them would take turns kicking the box around on the ground, listening as the thing inside banged around its tiny prison, letting fly a string of angry and colorful curses, all of which was met with laughter and taunts by the crude drunks. Soon, Lefty was close enough that he could hear the voice in the box more clearly, but that only served to make him even more confused. The voice sounded old and wise, yet small at the same time. It was speaking his language, but in a strange way that he would only later come to recognize as a northern accent. The voice reminded him of his grandfather, a kind elderly man whom Lefty could just barely remember. He had been a friendly storytelling figure, who had sadly passed away when Lefty was but a small child, leaving behind nothing except a few fond but hazy memories. For a brief moment, Lefty couldn't help but imagine a miniature version of the old man being flung around inside the box, a tiny grandpa being mercilessly bullied by a group of much younger and much more powerful men. In that moment, a flash of anger consumed the boy, and without thinking, he stepped forward and shouted at the group. Hey, he said, followed by a short cough. <coughs> stop, uh, stop doing that he added, gesturing half-heartedly towards the box with a weary hand. 
He had tried to sound authoritative, but his voice was dull after hours of disuse, and very dry due to a complete lack of water, making him sound far less intimidating than he had hoped. For nearly a moment, there was only awkward silence as the merriment of the men ceased, and they turned to look at Lefty. By this point, the light of the sun had completely faded behind the mountains, casting everything in shades of black and blue, making the three figures and their box stand out even more clearly against the contrasting orange glow of their raging fire. Between the growing darkness, their intense intoxication, and their preoccupation with the box, the trio of chefs hadn't noticed Lefty's approach. As such, his sudden intrusion into their petty fun was as surprising to them as it was unwanted. All three of them quickly forgot about what they were doing, and instead turned to focus entirely on Lefty, the smell of alcohol actually growing stronger as they began to breathe in his general direction, and stronger still as they began stumbling towards him. I'll spare you the words they spouted at Lefty, partially because many of them are obscene to the point of bad taste, but mostly because it's difficult to transcribe the slurred speech of three drunken men, all talking in unison. Regardless of what they actually said, it was clear to everyone involved that there was a problem, and while a few simple words may have started that problem, words were certainly not going to be the solution. Now, Lefty was not a particularly moral young man. In fact, it's safe to say he had no sense of justice whatsoever. Ashtab, after all, was a small community where everyone knew everyone and resources were plentiful. People there had little reason to lie or steal, and even less reason to be violent. As such, lessons on morality hadn't been included in Lefty's already minimal education. The idea of bravery, of standing up for what's right against the odds, was completely foreign to Lefty. And yet, when confronted by three large men who obviously intended to harm him, Lefty didn't do the smart thing and run out into the desert, where even his tired body could have carried him faster and farther than the wobbly legs of the angry drunk men in front of him. Instead, he stood his ground, and in that moment, he realized something. It's wrong to torment the weak. Lefty didn't need to be told this, didn't have to learn it from experience. It was something he just knew. He could not simply run away and leave this caged creature, whatever it was, in the hands of these awful men. He had never fought before in his life, never had a reason to raise his fist in violence, but that night he tightened his grip on his shovel, lifted it in a way he had never thought to before, stepped forward, and swung as hard as he could. And in that moment, Lefty realized something else. It's really satisfying to hit people. This lesson Lefty did learn from experience. He learned it the moment he felt the flat end of his shovel connect with the head of the man closest to him. There was a fantastic clanging sound which echoed off the nearby mountains as iron struck something much harder than the loose sand Lefty was used to. A delightful shock traveled down the wooden handle and up Lefty's arms amplifying the satisfying sensation of justified violence that filled him to his core. Then, just as quickly as it began, the moment ended, with the quiet plop of an overweight man falling limply to the ground. For a moment, the other two men paused, realizing for the first time that they had picked a fight with someone wielding a decent weapon, while they themselves were armed only with a half-empty bottle of booze. Before their inebriated minds could decide if they should try and throw the bottle at Lefty, or perhaps formulate some words that might de-escalate the situation, Lefty took another step towards them, and raised his shovel high. He was eager to see if he'd get the same satisfaction from attacking them as he had from the first man. He did. With two swift blows, both men quickly joined their companion on the sandy ground, their bodies laying limp, as the light from the fire danced across their near-motionless forms. Lefty stood triumphantly over them, breathing heavy, his heart racing with excitement. 
Whatever Lefty's plans may have been before this, they certainly didn't involve fighting anyone. But now that he had, he was sure it was something he wanted to do again. He looked down at the shovel in his hands as if he was seeing it for the first time, viewing the familiar tool in an entirely different light. For once in his utterly boring life, Lefty thought of the future, thought of the potential that he and the shovel might have, and wondered if there were perhaps other people, other things out in this world, that he could also smack upside the head. This moment of oddly violent introspection was broken by the sound of a tiny elderly voice coughing not far away. <coughs> a second later, it spoke, sounding tired and uncertain. Hello? It said cautiously. Someone want to let me out of here? It asked, clearly unaware of what had just transpired. Yeah, said Lefty after a half moment of thought, casually dropping his shovel to the ground as he went over to where the box lay. He crouched down to pick it up and carefully lifted the cube, rotating it ever so slowly so as not to discomfort the already unfortunate creature within. Finally, he found the top, upon which sat a small latch that locked the lid in place. Taking a deep breath, Lefty undid the latch and slowly opened the box.